Hi, this is Dave. Uh, welcome to my inaugural uh, diversion of 2021. Um, this, in this video, what we're going to be talking about is the, this particular device, the Hearsay 1000, a speech synthesis and recognition system for the Commodore 64. I've had this since the 80s. Um, mine is dated 1986. And so it was basically the state of the art in personal computers for voice, uh, voice work in the, in the 80s. Uh, you might have seen this this particular device. Um, someone sent it into Adrian on Adrian's digital, digital basement in January of last year, and he showed it in. I think what only was his second mail call video, and he he gave a look at the device. He saw, for instance, first there was a, a little uh, sort of a knob or plastic piece over here on the edge, and that's where the microphone is. And on mine, I've taken that plastic piece off, and you'll see it's because the the device is. Um, particularly compromised with respect to its ability to hear things. So being able to flex that around and move it to different directions is nice. The other thing I see is that I've modified mine to have a separate audio cable coming off the audio on the machine. And I think that's probably because when I got this device in the 80s, I, was pro I probably didn't have a good monitor that I was using with it. And I wanted to put, put that audio into a separate device instead of having it run it through my monitor. Or I just wanted a different monitor. Now, um, in the 80s, uh, this, this idea of speech and speech recognition from a computer was, it was getting quite a bit of buzz, but not for any really good reason. In fact, when, when Adrian received it in his mail call, he's paging through this manual and reading about it, and he says, I'm sure in practice this stuff works terribly. <laughs> and I think I'm going to show you that that's pretty much the case. But for whatever reason, there was some buzz at the time. Oh, and another thing, as a nice contrast to what I'm doing here, Mike of Mike's Retro Tech uh, just recently looked at the Commoner Magic Voice and did a, a few videos on it. So take a look at that. I'll have the links to that in the comments, or in the, I'll have the links to that in the description. And I've done a bit of research about the device, and uh, coincidentally, it's a good follow-on to my, my previous video. In my previous video, we looked at one of the... Um, the, the first generation of video game consoles that used the general instrument AY-3-8500 uh, chip in it, which was called Pong on a Chip or Pong in a Chip. In this one, the Hearsay 1000 has the general instrument's SP-1000 speech processor. And presumably that's why it's called the Hearsay 1000. It's named for that chip. That chip came out in 1982. Um, when In the last video, we were talking about the chip that I had in my game console was dated 81, and it was something that came out like circa 76. So General Instruments is, is manufacturing ICs that are enabling a couple of different industries. In that case, the game industry. In this case, uh, speech synthesis. So here's the device in its package. It's got this sort of um, cheap plastic uh, case, uh, four regular uh, standard screws uh, self-tapping into it. Uh, I found when I went to plug it in my on my bread bin that uh, it didn't fit very well. In fact, it, it, the 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 cartridge edge protrudes so little from the case that it barely touched the contacts. So when you'll see me using it on the bench later, I'm going to take it out of the case so that it can be inserted more completely. So the um, the device came with uh, with a manual, a very a very brief manual. Uh, but talks about a lot of its features. It's pretty densely packed with things and a demo disc. And we'll look at some of the demo disc and then I'll use the what I've learned from the manual to build a real application that'll show you something like what you saw in the intro uh, about what the what I think is the basically the limits of what the device can do. But before we go to the bench and look at the device and, and let me show you how it works, let's take a look at what was going on with general instruments. So um, 1982 uh, general general instrument comes up with this SP1000, and here's a couple of the here's a couple of the ways that they advertised it. Um, but basically, um, basically it's a combination speech synthesizer and speech recognizer running on five volts, uh, and uh, it's ostensibly supposed to support talker independent or de or dependent voice uh, recognition. Uh, so not an, not particularly expensive and. What I found in, in looking for uh, up the SP-1000, one of the neat things I found was this. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Ciarcia, who had a regular column called Ciarcia's Circuit Seller in, that ran in Byte Magazine, 
did this project called the Listener 1000. And what it is is um, a low-cost uh, speech recognition system based on the SP-1000, one of the first projects that did it. This, this was in 1984, and he lays out how to build a card for the Apple II that does speech synthesis and recognition using this chip. And it turns out that he ended up um, advertising it in there that he, uh, he would make it and sell it as well. Uh, he, advertised for, he advertised it for sale, assembled and tested for $189, um, and, uh, and later I'd seen it for about $150. So, so the precursor to the Here C1000 is actually the Listener 1000, a device that was available for the Apple II, and then he also made this available for the 64 later. So the next breakthrough in my research that I found was, um, awesomely, in 1986, a, issue, a number of issues of magazines, specifically Ahoy! magazine first, that did a review of speech synthesizers in two parts um, in, in uh, early uh, 1986. And they were called Speech Synthesizers for the Commodore Computers by Morton um, Kevelson. And the interesting thing that um, Morton does in his article is he reviews a product this is something like January of 86, called the Hearsay 64, formerly called the Recognizer, from a company called Research and Speech Technology, Inc. And he, re and he re also reviews the Listener 1000 from the Micromind, Inc., which is Steve Ciocera's company, um, and says that they're so nearly the same thing that he's just going to review them as one product. So what, I think what we found is the lineage of the Hearsay 1000. It was basically, it basically came out of that Steve C. Acera project that was published in Byte Magazine where he was selling the, the device um, configured for the Apple II and managed to also build one for the 64. And then some folks uh, built at, le at least one other company that was, that was selling this and originally called the Hearsay 64, presumably developed into the Hearsay 1000 when they merged with this product, the Listener 1000. So the other cool thing the article in, in Ahoy does is gives a little history lesson. It basically says the setup is that Milton Bradley, the toy company, um, was, was uh, supporting research and doing research into speech recognition and speech synthesis systems for toys. And out of that research came General Instrument being, uh, developing a series of chips, uh, but one of which and culminated in this SP-1000. Now, uh, as people sometimes do, some employees left uh, general instrument. And one of them uh, left uh, named Dennis Intravia and formed his own company called Mind's Eye Technology and developed a speech recognition system based on the SP-1000. And that was subsequently presented in, the, in that construction project with Steve Ciacera in November of 1984. Then later on, another uh, ex-general uh, instrument person, Steve Velt Beltry, uh, or he works at a, as a VP of sales and marketing at a company called R-A-S-T, or RIST, which is um, Research in Speech Technology, Inc. And they developed this other product. Um, the, so, so basically there's a merging somehow of these two products, and that's how we get a Commodore 64 product that's based on what was originally that Apple II product but, and based on the SP-1000. So all, all the links to those different resources I'll have in the description, so check those out. You can read the articles themselves. But basically, we, we, it looks like the device came out about 1986. There were some early versions in early 86 uh, for the Commodore 64. And I have my bread bin from 19, uh, 1983 that I'm using it on. I said the first thing I found was that it was hard to plug in because of the form factor. The next thing I found is I plugged it in, and the restore key didn't work on that. I happen to have one of the uh, the infamous rare, fairly rare, and something in the 200,000s in terms of count production count, uh, 64s that have uh, like one of the one of the very early motherboards, the one where the motherboard actually differed in manufacturer than the schematic, and. Uh, what I found is that the restore key didn't work. Well, the Hearsay 1000, the whole way you act, the, activate its features about screen reading and, and, and input is you have to hit the restore key, and then it goes into a voice menu system, so it doesn't mess up your screen at the same time. Well, if I can't hit the restore key, then I can't use the device. So in my research on that, I found um, Mark from the Retro Channel had posted a nice video based on you know ways to fix that restore key problem on the early 64s of going all the way back to the 90s, and I used the technique he did to replace one of the capacitors on there, and it looks like this, and I'll leave a link to uh, the discussion about what exactly is going on there, but basically the, pro the, the problem, the known problem with the restore, restore key is easy to fix by just uh, soldering a different capacitor in place.
Uh, that said, I think we're ready to go to the bench and I'll give you a look at the device. So here's a little glimpse of what's on the demo disc that comes with the Hearsay 1000. Choose one of the following demonstrations and see for yourself Hearsay 1000's many advanced features and capabilities. So the first thing I notice is there's nothing in the documentation about how to get it to speak like that. Um, that's some um, deep magic about how, you know how they got that voice there. Hello, I'm Ackler the Clown. Welcome to Ackler's Circus. Press the space bar to choose the game you want. Circle. This is a square. Press the space bar and say square. Square. This is a triangle. Press the space bar and say triangle. Triangle. Let's look at those shapes again. Say the name of this shape. Triangle. Square. Circle. Circle. You are right. So what I found is these these uh, pieces of software that support it. They were sold by the you know the company itself, and there I found some pricing information on the magazines. But as far as I can tell, they're the only applications that were ever written. To work with the hearsay 1000 and it costs somewhere in the range of $30 each. Purchase Aqua Circus today. All right, well, that just wants me to commit suicide, so let's see. Uh, a, couple, a couple other demos on here, um, they're pretty simple. One uh, has you train it on a couple of words and act like you're playing the opening of Zork or you open a mailbox or something. Uh, there's another one that has you play the change the pitch and stuff, but I'll, I'll do that in a in a real application instead of just playing with the demo. All right, so what we have here is my Google Home uh, connected up as usual to the internet on my Wi-Fi. Uh, the Hearsay 1000 in my 64. And uh, and we're going to go through a little uh, session uh, training the Hearsay 1000 to know a couple of words. So what I'm going to do is uh, hit the restore key. Hearsay 1000. Put it in training mode. You have zero words trained. Enter number to train. We'll train number one. One. Play turn. Press space. Then say word. So I'm going to train it to know the phrase 64. 64. 64. Press space. Then say word again. 64. All right, so we're going to have it spell out 64 and a return. Then I'm going to hit the run stop key. Now we're going to train a second word, and that's the, a command to so that I can ask it the time. Enter number to train to play turn press space then say word time press space then say word again time word trained enter command sequence like let's say, let's say time. the word time Empty. play turn enter all right so now we've trained it to no two words and let's uh, return back out of there uh, to basic and I've written a basic program here let's load it 
64 relay. And just a small basic program that reads input uh, to the string S and uh, tests to see if it's the word 64 or the word time or the letter Q and, uh, and acts accordingly. So I want to run my program. And now I want to turn on recognition mode. All right, so now my program's running and waiting for input from me. Uh, because it's in recognition mode, it's expecting it by voice. So let's say, um, hello. I thought I said 64. Time. Time. What time is it? Time. 64. Time. All right, so it's not understanding. It's not understanding what I'm saying very well. What I remember is to get the Google Home to understand the hearsay, it works better if I change the pitch. So let's go into the the menu and change the pitch of the voice. Hearsay 1000. Test string mode function 1. Enter string pitch. 7. 7. Return. Enter. Return. 64. 64. 64. Time. Hey, Google. What time is it? It's 3.09 p.m. <laughs> Finally. Here, say 1,000 tests. Plain mode function 7. Plain text is now silent. Your recognition is now off. Return. And it crashed again. <laughs> bye bye. So I hope you enjoyed that look at one of the weirder Commodore 64 peripherals, uh, the Hearsay 1000. Um, the, the, the thing that I find interesting about it is, it, you know, it was a curiosity then. Clearly they got my, you know, whatever, 50 or 80 bucks or whatever it was at the time because I thought it would be an interesting thing to play with. But the lack of integration with software and the poor performance in, uh, is, just, is just ridiculous. And I think it's sort of, in the last 30 plus years, the, the same way a lot of us probably feel about voice recognition systems. We don't like talking to machines. They make mistakes. It's impersonal, um, pretty frustrating. Uh, in fact, today, the two ways that I use it is, you know, that um, Google Home, I like that to be able to ask things of it once in a while. Uh, it works neat for my mom. If she's playing a game, we can say, you know, how do you spell this? What does this word mean? That kind of thing. But uh, I use that. And then the other thing I use is actually I like uh, reading the Globe and Mail uh, from Canada because they have the feature where you can have it read the article to you. And I find that sometimes when I'm read, you know, doing something else in the morning or having my coffee that I prefer to have the, the articles read. And so uh, that looks like this. Using its own in-house processor chips. But other than that, you know, speech, speech synthesis and recognition, it's made a, you know, leaps and bounds from the, from the time it was in the 80s, but uh, still not particularly a pleasant, you know, interface between us and the, some of the greatest machines that, that we've ever created. Anyway, that's, that's, the, that's my, uh, that's my diversion for today. Uh, I hope you uh, have a great 2021. Uh, best wishes to you and yours. Uh, you know, like this if you want some more content like this. Certainly subscribe if you want me to keep doing uh, doing more of the content. But anyway, take care. Um, um, um. Hey, Google.